Hey, it's so good to be here. Um, as she said, I'm Ryan Moore with Northwest Collegiate Ministries. I do ministry at the University of Oregon and Northwest Christian University. I'm also excited to introduce you to one of our uh, newest um, staffers, actually. Um, PJ Pruitt is here. Um, PJ came on in January. Yeah, give him a hand. PJ came on in January with us to work with international students. I just want to brag on him a little bit. He has done an outstanding job. Um, we had been meeting some international students, but he has just taken that to a whole new level. Um, we did a Cinco de Mayo party in May, and there's like 25 to 30 international students crammed into our house, enjoying Mexican food and hitting the pinata outside, and they were just having a ball, things they'd never done before, never seen before. Um, and just able to connect with them so that we can have this ongoing relationship and share the gospel. Most of those students don't know Jesus. What an incredible opportunity it is for us to have people from all over the world at our doorstep that we can share the hope of the gospel with. And so super excited about PJ and him being here. He came as an intern to work from January to December and has decided to stay. He's going to be raising his support to stay on full time and work with us on campus into the coming years. So we're very excited about PJ coming and hanging out with us. So hopefully you get a chance to meet him today uh, in between services and talk to him a little bit. I want to say thank you guys for just being a partner with us. Uh, we serve meals every Thursday night to students, and you guys have brought meals um, for years now, uh, once a month, and provided some of the food for our students. Our students love food, and um, as you can imagine. And so one way that we connect with non-Christian students and some of our Christian students invite their friends to come is to our Thursday night meals. And uh, students come and hang out, and there are times that we've sat around the table and had people spilling out into the living room and out back that we've had more non-Christians than Christians. And that's exciting to me because that allows us to have great gospel conversations, allow the kingdom of God to rub off on and, and open doors of conversation with students who have not, some of them never heard the gospel before. And so it's super exciting. And you're a part of that. You're a part of that. So thank you for your support and your, the way you sponsor us financially, the way you help us in prayer. Um, I want to say to you, if you want to know more about what's going on on kind of a month-to-month basis, PJ and I both have email newsletters, and I have a sign-up sheet that I brought with me today, and if you'd like to get on that newsletter, um, it's just a simple email, we'll send out those little blips about what's happening on campus, things you can pray for, and things that are going on in our lives, our families' lives, and so if you'd like to do that, please let me know after, after service, and I'll get you signed up for that, and you can hear and be able to pray specifically for things going on on campus. And before I begin our message, I want to ask you to pray for one specific thing coming into the fall. Summer is great. I mean, students, most students are gone, so we're planning, and we're preparing, we're praying for the fall. And one of the things as we launch into the new year, we meet students at a thing called Week of Welcome through um, what they call the flock party. And so they have all kinds of organizations come together, and they have this big kind of activities fair, and there's all kinds of interesting games and music and stuff going on for freshmen especially to come and meet people and get plugged into campus. And so it's a great opportunity for us to meet freshmen. In the last few years, we've had a ton of people that we've met that first day and signed up. But we're praying that that this year, God will bring some people along who are said, I want to plug in. I want to be involved. I want to be discipled and mentored. I want to grow. I want to serve and reach our campus. And so uh, the last few years, we've had a, a, a couple people, but we're really praying this year that God opens those doors and allows us to meet more freshmen this year. So if you'll pray with us in that, uh, we really know that that battle happens in the spiritual realm, and that God does that kind of stuff. And so we're still working hard, serving freshmen, trying to meet people, but we ask you to pray along with us that God does some good things as we come in the fall. All right? So let me pray, and then we'll jump to our teaching time. God, thank you so much for this church. Uh, I thank you for their pastor, Toby, uh, for what a good pastor and man that he is, that he loves you and he longs to lead this church into um, greater depth with you and greater fruitfulness in this community. I pray for him as he's taking some time to rest, that you'll just give him a chance to to unwind and um, to to fully feel the, the fullness of rest as he is away. And I pray for this church. I pray that you'll continue to guide them, Lord. Um, help them to just go deeper in you, Lord. I pray, I pray for our college ministry 
and for the students that will meet in the fall, Lord, that you'll just draw people to yourself. God, thank you for your, your Holy Spirit and how you move in us and how you work and change lives. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, well, if you have your Bible, please look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now, as you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. Um, Have you ever wanted something only to get it later and find out, nope, I didn't want that at all? Anybody ever experienced that? A couple weeks ago, um, PJ and I were working at the campus food bank. And they they had this item that had been donated for them to give away. It was a coconut milk-based blueberry ice cream. And as I was showing students and people were picking out the things that they were interested in, that was just calling to me because I I like coconut milk. I love blueberries. And so at the end of my shift, I said to the the leader, Doug, I said, Doug, do you mind if I have one of those? He's like, oh, yeah, thanks for your help. Just go ahead and take one. We got a ton of them. So I grabbed that thing, and I go home, and uh, later on that evening, I bust it out. I'm super excited about this, right? I dig my spoon into that thing and put it in my mouth, and I was like, oh, my goodness. But maybe I just, I need to try it again. So I, I tried it again and put my mouth again. I was like, oh, why would anyone put this in their mouth? I mean, it was, it was terrible, right? And so it's funny to me that, like, the whole time I'm talking about this product and the thing, and I'm thinking about it, now don't think less of me for taking from the food bank, okay, please. Um, but I get home and I try this thing, and it was, it was terrible. It was just awful. I also just remember a time when I was in college, I was dating this girl named Wendy Thomas, and I was a freshman, and as we started getting to know each other, I, my heart was just sunk on this girl. Um, she had all the things that I had kind of thought ahead of time that I wanted in someone I wanted to marry, right? So I was dating this girl and just thinking that she was the one. Well, one day, she comes into um, her dorm room, and she puts in this song. Have you ever heard the song, Unanswered Prayers? I think it's George Strait. Is it George Strait? I'm not country, so I don't know. No. Garth Brooks. Thank you. Thank you, Garth Brooks. Anyway, I hate country, but she plays it anyway. And, uh, and she's saying to me, basically, um, I know that you kind of think this is going somewhere, but it's not. And so she broke things off that day. And uh, <laughs> I was heartbroken, right? I mean, my heart was set that she was the one. Well, months go by, and I look back on that relationship and realize that, man, I'm so thankful for a number of reasons. One, I began to see things maybe a little more clearly after the fact that I was seeing in the middle of the relationship. She, she had a hard time being open and talking about things that were really kind of deep and close to her. And then later on, I met my now wife, who I absolutely love and know that she's the only one for me. And so I am thankful for those unanswered prayers, right? Right? But it's so funny to me looking back on on that situation. In the middle of it, it's all that I wanted. I I wanted to be with this girl. And afterwards, I'm so thankful that that didn't happen. Have you experienced that? Sometimes there are little things like ice cream and sometimes there are big things like relationships or, or like purchasing something big like a house or a car or something of that nature. Well, it's interesting, you know, the... The writer of Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun, right? This kind of thing has been going on for a long, long time. And we actually see that right here happening in 1 Samuel. So look at me at 1 Samuel chapter 8. I want to read the first four verses, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. It says, when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes, excuse me, bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. All right, let's stop there for a minute. Samuel is a prophet over Israel, one of the last judges, one of the last um, just 
leaders over Israel who hears directly from God and expresses to the people what God desires, right? Samuel is a good prophet and a good man. He's getting old. He's going to turn some of the responsibilities over to his sons, but his sons are not good men. They're taking bribes. They're perverting justice. And the people of Israel recognize this and say, this, this isn't good. So they come to Samuel and they ask for a king. Now, what are, the, what are the reasons that they're asking for a king? Do you see it there? One is Samuel's sons, right? They're not, not living justly. But what's the other reason? He said, give us a king just like all the other nations have. We want what everybody else has. <laughs> what? Yeah. Now, what is it that draws us so much to want to be like everybody else? I mean, we've all experienced that, right? We've all felt that desire at some point in our lives to want something that someone else has, to, to want to be like someone else. Well, here are the people of Israel, and they say, we want, we want to be like everybody else. We want to have a king like everyone else. But is that God's design? Is it God's plan for his people, and that's us included today, to be like everybody else? No, not at all. In fact, if you look at Leviticus chapter 20, in verse 26, God is expressing to his people, you must be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart from all other people to be my very own. The word holy in Hebrew means set apart. You are to be different. You are to be like me. And so God's design for his people, that's us included, is to be like him, not to try to be like everybody else. But listen, we have this tension, don't we? This is very applicable for us today. We live in this tension, especially our young people. Youth, if you're a teenager here, I have such great sympathy for you because you probably feel this more than anybody else right now. As a teenager, there's so much that our friends are doing. They're watching games that they're playing, things that they're wearing, talking about and doing that's pulling us to want to be like everyone else, to want to be accepted, to want to fit in. Because there's this feeling that if we do that, we'll, we'll be liked by people, we'll be loved by people, we'll be appreciated. And so we have this tension. At the same time, some of those things are things that God says, I don't want you to do. Those aren't things that are gonna be good for your mind or your heart. They're not gonna lead you closer to me, to God, but farther away, and so God is pulling us and saying, no, that's not where you need to be. Now listen, adults, you're not off the hook either. You ever heard the expression, keeping up with the Joneses? It's, it's interesting that even as an adult, we still feel those things. We still live in that tension. That everything in our culture, our sight is pushing us to, to, to conformity. What's interesting is that as a culture, we tend to like independence, individuality, but we feel this pressure to conform. Listen, if you want to be an individual and not conform to the culture in Eugene, Oregon, you need to follow Jesus, right? Because that's way different than the culture around us. We have this tension that we live in. We want to be like everyone else. And yet God says, no, I've called you to be set apart and holy, that you are for me. Now God responds to the request, and I want you to pay attention to some of the things he says here. We're going to read verses five, sorry, 6 through 18. It says, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Now listen, this word is displeased is probably not strong enough. I think the translation in Hebrew says this is evil in his eyes, right? It's pretty strong. Samuel says, this, this is evil in my eyes. This question of give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, 
Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. God says of his people, they are rejecting me as their king. Verse 8 is an indictment on the people of Israel. He says, ever since I brought you out of Egypt, you've been doing this. Ever since I rescued you from slavery and brought you into this land, you have been turning your hearts away from me and serving other gods. And you're doing it again. You see, right now, I am your king. It is God who's been the one who fought their battles for them, right? Remember coming out of Egypt? If you have an understanding of the Old Testament history, uh, if not, go back and read through Exodus. It's awesome. As God brings his people out of Egypt, the Egyptian army is chasing them. And it's not the mighty warriors of Israel that rescues them. It's, it's not the brilliant tactician of a general. No, it's God and God alone. God parts the Red Sea. The people of Israel cross over on dry land and then God brings it back together to defeat their enemies. When they enter into the promised land and they're going to attack Jericho to take this new land. Is it the generals and the fierce warriors that take Jericho? No. If you haven't read it, read through Joshua. It's amazing. God asked them to walk around the city several times, blow a trumpet, and yell. And God does the rest. It's God who fights their battles for them, not, not a king or, or a general. And it's God who was their source of justice. They, they didn't have to have a king to judge over them. It was God who began to tell them, this is what is right. This is what is just. God brought that to people like Moses, people like Joshua, to their leaders, and they expressed it to the people, and they were the ones who helped them understand. God was their king. But the people were asking for a human king, because that's what it seems like they want. That's what everybody else has. Now God says, go ahead and give them what they want, but warn them solemnly. Are you sure this is what you want to do? And what does he say is going to happen when they have a king? What will come? They'll start to have taxes, right? Because the king will need to fill his own coffers to do his own building and take care of his own things. He's going to take from you flocks, <clears throat> to feed his people. He's going to take from you your children. Some of your sons are going to be in his army to go and do battle for him and for the nation. Some of your daughters are going to come and they're going to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He's going to take your donkeys and your grain and your vineyards and the very best of what you have. 
to supply his needs and his servants. And so Samuel goes back to the people and he tells them all these things that God expresses. And he explains, warning them what is to come. And he tells them, look, if you get a king, when he comes, you will beg me to change it. And that day, I, I'm not going to go back. In other words, if you make this choice, you're going to have to live with it. You have to live with the consequences of your own choice. Now, what do we learn from God? What do we learn about God through his warning? What do we learn about who God is and the nature of God? Well, one thing I think is that God is merciful in his warning us. He didn't have to do that. He said, hey, you want a king? You want to reject me? Fine. But no, he doesn't do that. He said, look, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And he details it out. But you also see in his warning that he's just in letting them live and letting us live with our decisions, right? God is merciful in the warning, but he's also just in letting us live for the consequences of our actions. As we go to verse 19, we'll see Israel's response. Verse 19 and 20. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So God warns them, and people go, okay, God, you're right. We don't really want a king. No, that's not what happened at all, right? They said, forget that. It doesn't matter. We want a king. Have you ever experienced this? Uh, I'm a parent. I have four kids. I experience this all the time, and it always baffles my mind. Especially talking about teenagers. I'm talking to my teenagers about the choice they're about to make. And you just not a moral choice. It's just something they want to do and don't want to do. And I'm, are you sure you want to do this? Because, you know, if you go out in 30 degrees without a coat, you're going to be cold. Are you sure? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Right? And then we're outside doing something, and they're shivering. You know, it's like... I so wish that, that my kids at times would just listen. But you know what? The truth is, I was the same way. You know? And if you think about it, you probably were the same way too. How many of us would completely ignore our parents? Like they were the dumbest people in the world. Right? And now as an adult, I'm like, man, my parents were so smart. Why did I not listen? <laughs> and not just our parents. Right? Sometimes there are other people in our lives who have a lot of wisdom to speak into us, and sometimes we just completely, we completely ignore that. And then we get a few months down the road or a few years and we realize that, man, I should have listened. And now it's too late. Well, we see the same thing in Israel. They said, nope, give us a king. We want to be like other people. We want a king to lead us into battle. We want a king to judge us. It doesn't matter if God had done that before and won all of our battles for us. We want a king to do that now. It doesn't matter if God had been a holy and good judge before. We want a king to do that now. Even though people aren't capable of being completely holy and just in their dealings, right? So they're crying out for a king. And so in verse 21, it says, And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make, give them a king. Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go 
every man to his city. In other words, go, go home. This is going to happen. God said yes. God grants a request. Now, finish this sentence for me. Some people have to learn the hard way. Why is it called the hard way? Well, I know it's kind of obvious. Because it's hard. When we don't listen to good advice, to wisdom in our life, we figure it out eventually, but we have to learn the hard way. And the problem with the hard way is it's hard. We have to deal with all those consequences. We have to deal with all that heartache, with all the junk we just took ourselves through. And the effects that that has had on our lives and the lives of people around us. Sometimes not just us. On our family, on our friendships, on our relationships. Those choices have rippling effects and we have to live with that. Sometimes we think we get in this mindset of, well, I just have to learn the hard way. No. <laughs> Why would you do that to yourself? There's a reason it's called the hard way. Because the consequences are, in fact, hard. So what do we learn about God and him giving the people what they ask for? Sometimes God's judgment, now listen, sometimes God's judgment in our lives is giving us what we want. Did you hear that? In turn, sometimes God's mercy in our lives is not giving us what we want. Who's the only person that knows the difference? The only person who can see on that road as it forks out on which way you're going to go, the only one who can see what's merciful and just is God. He's the only one. Oh, you'll see it eventually, right? After the fact. And sometimes you're happy about the mercy that you receive. You look back and sometimes you're sad about the judgment. But we have to recognize sometimes that just because we want something doesn't mean it's the right thing or that it's good. And sometimes when we go to God and I do this too and so I, I'm looking at myself and we give God all these reasons why what we're asking for is right and good and should happen, right? Right? And it totally makes sense in our minds and we can only see the good things. And, and sometimes in those situations, God says no. And in those times, in that moment, we have to make a choice. Are we putting our trust in the God of the universe the one who made all things, the one who loves us so intently that he sent his own son, Jesus, to die at the cross, that we may be forgiven and have life everlasting with him. Are we going to trust this God who is just and holy and good? Are we going to get angry and say, whatever? God didn't give me what I wanted. He must not be real. So many times I hear that. I ask God and I ask God for this and he didn't answer. Well, maybe his answer was no. Maybe his answer was wait. But just because you ask doesn't mean that's what should happen. And we tend to place ourselves in the position of God like we know better. Like we're going to God and saying, God, this is what should happen. And God says, oh, thanks, Ryan. I really appreciate that. I needed your help. He doesn't do that, right? <laughs> That's not how that works. The people of Israel, all they could see was the good things of other nations and having a king. That's all they could see. This is what we want. They couldn't even hear God's warning.
So let's bring this up to 2016. There is a tension that you will feel, that we all feel, at work, home, in a circle of friends, between wanting to be like those around us and God's calling us to be set apart. And as followers of Jesus, we have to live in that tension. That will always be there. What God has asked us to do is to trust him. Trust that although it seems like this over here and fitting in will bring acceptance and love and all the things that we want, the trust that God is saying no, that it actually takes you down a path that you don't want to be on. Once you put that coconut blueberry ice cream in your mouth, you'll realize that is not what you want. <laughs> right? <laughs> we have to live in that tension and God asks us to trust him. To, to not focus on what is normal or expected by our culture, but how God has called us to live. I think secondly, we can save ourselves a lot of heartache. We can keep ourselves from learning the hard way. But the only way we do that is if we walk in the light. We walk in step with Jesus. We spend time with God every day and we listen to the Holy Spirit. That's gonna take time. It's gonna take some effort on your part. It's gonna take maybe getting up early, staying up a little later at night so you can take some time to read through the scriptures, to spend time in prayer, getting to know God more deeply. It also means having people in your life who, one, know you and, and know you well enough, deep enough, can see you live, that they can speak into your life. And if you don't have a circle of friends, of believers, who know you that well, that means that that's your next step. It's getting involved in some kind of small group through the church. Asking someone here who's maybe a little bit older to just spend some time together, have coffee. Someone who's been down the road a little bit in their walk with Christ. Having a mentor in your life. Spending time asking questions, talking about these decisions that you're facing so that you're not just doing it on your own, but you are in prayer and you're walking with the Lord and you're going to God with all those choices and you're going before other people who love God, who care about you, and you're talking to them about some of those choices too so they can help you. And when someone says, you know, I just don't think that's a good idea. I, I don't know that's gonna lead you where you wanna go. I see some big pitfalls ahead if you go that direction that we don't just ignore that. How many times we have people in our lives who say, man, I, I don't think this relationship is as a healthy one. I'm not sure this is where you should be. And we just completely ignore that because that's what we want. Having people in our lives who love God and care about us, maybe that's your parents, maybe that's a Sunday school teacher, maybe that's your pastor, maybe that's somebody in your life who you can talk to and process some of these things with so they can help you make good decisions so you won't have to learn the hard way. We all need that. We need to recognize the warnings that God gives us. I heard a, a joke one time. It's not a very good joke, so bear with me here. But there's a guy, he's on top of a roof. You may have heard this too. There's a flood. And he's calling out to God, God, save me. Right? And so God brings a guy by on a boat. He says, hey, jump in. The guy's like, no, man, I'm waiting for God. He's going to save me. Okay. So he rows on. Another, like, motorboat comes up to him, and the water's rising, you know. And uh, he sends another guy, and the guy's like, hey, jump in. He's like, no, I'm waiting for God. He's going to save me. 
So the guy goes on, then a helicopter comes. I mean, the water's really getting up high. The helicopter comes, and they're like putting a rope down. He's like, no, no, God's going to save me. So the helicopter flies off. The guy drowns and dies. He stands before God and says, God, what happened? I believe that you're going to save me. And God said, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sometimes God brings people into our lives, right, that are, that are trying to help us from learning the hard way. I think there's a lot that we can learn here from the people of Israel and they're wanting a king, but I think it's probably wise of us not to get too um, judgmental towards them because we, don't we do the same thing? I know that I do. But it's my desire not to do that. It's my hope for you that you begin processes that help you not do that anymore, not learn the hard way, not ignore God's warnings but choose to live a life set apart, holy and trusting that that is the absolute best because that's what God wants for you.